This paper is at a crossroads of two areas of mathematics. Um, one is called representation theory, which is the study of manifestations of symmetry. And the other is number theory, which is about the solutions of equations like polynomial equations. So there's an example that everybody knows from high school, and that's the quadratic formula. So you have you have a quadratic equation, and then the quadratic formula, there's a plus and a minus in the quadratic formula, which means that there's a symmetry. There's two solutions, and there's a symmetry that exchanges the two. So there's a, some geometry going on that we don't pay very much attention to because it's a very simple kind of symmetry. But it turns out that that's actually the tip of a very large iceberg. And you can have, for example, polynomials that have four roots. They start with x to the fourth. And the, the symmetries of these roots are the symmetries of a cube. So it, what you do is you take the cube and you, the cube has four diagonals within it, and each diagonal corresponds to one of the roots of this polynomial. And there are 24 symmetries of the cube, the various ways of rotating the cube. And those are the symmetries of these roots. And so this is something that's very, uh, very old and, and very classical. What is difficult about it is these examples are very small, but it turns out to be very hard to know what kind of symmetries are possible. So that's one of the big questions in mathematics these days is what are the possible kinds of symmetries that arise from these equations? And in the 1960s, um, a mathematician named Robert Langlands, who just retired from the Institute for Advanced Study, made some conjectures that would predict which kinds of symmetries were possible in terms of other symmetries which might somehow be easier to find. The, the, pay, the, the penalty for these other new kinds of symmetries is that they exist in infinite dimensions. So we started out talking about symmetries of solutions of equations, and now we're trying to classify these kinds of symmetries. And now Langland says, well, you should go look at these other kinds of symmetries that uh, are a totally different kind that exist in an infinite number of dimensions. And there will be very strong relations between these infinite dimensional symmetries and these finite dimensional symmetries like we started out talking about. And these came to be known as uh, Langland's conjectures. And it's a big program in mathematics. And this paper uh, is uh, a verification of a very large number of cases of that, that what Langland's predicted was actually true. So what we did was we found both sides of the both kinds of the small symmetries and the big symmetries, and we showed how they were related. There's all kinds of properties in this relation, the very strong relations between the small symmetries and the big symmetries that are expected to hold. And so a lot of the paper was first constructing both kinds of symmetries and then showing that all the properties held. The roots of this area of math, as I said, go back to the quadratic formula, and, and but really uh, they go back to Euclid. And this idea, for example, the symmetries of the cube, the, the cube itself is constructed in Euclid. I mean, the, the point of Euclid's elements, back then the Greeks believed that there were uh, philosophical properties arising from the platonic solids that had something to do with earth, air, fire, and water, and that kind of thing. And there were five platonic solids, and each one of them had mystical properties. And it was important to know, first of all, that these five platonic solids existed, one of which is the cube. There's also the tetrahedron, the octahedron, the dodecahedron, and the icosahedron. First, to know that they existed, and then second, to be able to construct them by Euclidean means. And that's what Euclid's Elements is 13 books, and everything is building up to book 13. And in book 13, there's the construction by straight edge and compass of all these platonic solids and the proof that there are no others. So this is, is a... To me, this is one of the most exciting things about this area of mathematics, is that there are fundamental properties of nature that are waiting for us to find. They're not, we're not making it up. You know, it's not a, we didn't just make up the five platonic solids. It's, they're there, and, it's, and it was proved long, long ago that that's all there is in, in, those, in, in three dimensions. And, and this paper, in, in terms of the symmetries, for example, the symmetry of the cube is exactly coming from, from Euclid. Of course, these other things they had no clue about. But, but we can see what we do today in certain areas of mathematics, especially this one, this is why I like it so much, is that you can actually see the roots all the way down to the base of the tree. We're way out on far tips of the branches, but you can see all the way back to the roots of the subject, and I find that very exciting. 
So, um, so for the past two springs, I've been teaching a course in Euclid. You know, at a Jesuit university, Euclid used to be part of the part of the curriculum, and that disappeared several decades ago. But we've been trying to bring it back, and and I just it's just a wonderful thing to be able to see both through my students and through my work all the way back to the beginnings of, of, uh, of our subject. It's really a wonderful thing. One of the things that people ask, uh, whenever you get into a philosophical discussion about mathematics, one of the things that people ask is, do you think that mathematics is created by man? Is it something that we invent? Or is it something that, we, that is already out there and that we discover it? And I, uh, I think actually both kinds of mathematics exist. There is mathematics that's made up by man, and I think that's actually less interesting than, but than the other kind of mathematics, which is really discovered, like the five platonic solids that I was talking about. This is something that to me is there and it's waiting to be discovered. It so happened that it was in three dimensions. It was fairly easy for very intelligent people to find that 2,000 years ago. But all this other stuff that we're doing, it's taken longer because it's harder and it's deeper and it's in the infinite number of dimensions. But it's still there to be discovered. Even these infinite dimensional symmetries, just because you can't see them doesn't mean they're not there. And it turns out that you, you can ask questions and the answer will be revealed to you. It's not like you have to go make up an answer. The answer is there, but you have to find it and you have to be clever and you have to think very deeply. So I'm definitely someone who thinks that, um, that mathematics is a fundamental fact of the, of the universe that we live in. Um, so I'm on the discovered side. Mm -hmm. This paper took a long time to be written, um, and it went through several stages. The, the first was, um, I was thinking about this Langland's correspondence and was able to write down what I thought were some of the small symmetries and some of the big symmetries, and things seemed to be working very well. Uh, but there was one of the properties, remember I said that there are very strong properties about this correspondence, and one of them is one of the words in the title of the paper, which is stability. So the title of the paper is supercuspidal L packets. That's the symmetries, that's the two kinds of symmetries, and there's stability. And the stability is a very crucial and very difficult property that, these, uh, that this correspondence should have. And it so happened that I had a, a friend who was a postdoc at Harvard, Stephen DeBacher. I knew him since he was a graduate student, and he knew a lot about uh, what would be, he had the technical expertise to prove this uh, stability business. So um, one day over coffee, I showed him what I had done, and I said, you know, maybe we should write a paper together, and you can, we can try to prove this stability with, with your tools. And um, that's what we did. That took two years. Uh, so then we submitted the paper, and it took, so whenever you submit a paper to a journal, it, has to, it goes to a referee, and in the case of the annals, it goes to multiple referees. And so first they send it to people that just say, do you think it's even remotely good enough to be in this journal? And if they say that it is, then they send it to somebody who reads it very carefully. And that takes a long time, and so it took two years. And this is a very long and very difficult paper. It's 107 pages, and it's not easy. It, mathematics is so specialized that it's very hard to read anything that's not directly up your alley. Even Stephen and I, my co-author, and I had trouble understanding each other. We would each write, because we have our own way of thinking, we have our own set of tools, and what's easy for us is not easy for the other person. And so we, part of what w happened with this paper was we had, we, came, we had two different points of view, and then we had a lot of work to be done to just communicate with each other. And so the whole paper became not just two things being glued together, but actually one melange of a combination of ideas really harmoniously blending. Um, together, but the result of that is that it's very difficult for anybody to understand this paper, and so it took two years um, to be refereed. And in the course of doing all this, you can imagine uh, there's a lot of other people working in nearby areas of mathematics. Mathematics is a couple thousand years old. There's a lot of math out there already, and we need to know about it. It's not like in other sciences, you know, the biology that happened a hundred years ago probably we're not too interested in that biology 100 years. We're probably interested in what happened last week in biology. But in, in mathematics, we are interested in what happened. I'm interested in 2,000 years ago, because whatever happened then is still valid. It's, you know, once it's true, it's true. And so we have, uh, the, so the library for us is, is absolutely crucial, uh, because we need to know, it, it's an archive for the entire repository of mankind's knowledge of mathematics, which is extremely old and vast and doesn't go away. 
So there isn't a window of, well, you don't, don't need to know anything beyond that. We need to know everything. And so that's why we need a robust, and we have a very robust, um, far-ranging uh, library resources. And so that, if you look in the paper, there are 65 references, and I had to find those somewhere. Apparently, I was always interested in mathematics. I didn't, um, I've just uh, reconnected with a long-lost cousin whom I met um, only once when I was seven. And she told me that at that time, all I talked about was math, which I don't remember at all. Um, but I do know that my father, uh, he was a kind of a mathematician manqué. I mean, he really should have been a mathematician, but he, he had to support his family, and so he was an engineer. But my dad, when I was little, uh, my dad was, a, I was taking graduate math courses at, at UCLA, and I would see him working on his homework, and he took his homework very seriously. My father would wash his hands before he did his homework. And he had his Parker pen, uh, mechanical pencil, which back in the early 60s was a big deal, and he had his green engineering paper, and he would come back like a surgeon with his washed hands, and he would write up very neatly, writing his handwriting, and I would look at what, the, what was in the book, and I, I was maybe six or seven, so I, I, knew what, I knew what words were, and I knew what numbers were. But I would look at it, and there would be these funny symbols, like especially an integral sign. So an integral sign is like an elongated S, cross between an I and an S. And it would say, compute esoteric symbol. And I would ask my father what that was, and he said, well, I can't really explain it to you right now. You have to wait till you're older. So you can imagine the impression that that made on a, on a young boy. It's like, you're, it's like this high priesthood of, of mysterious symbols, and you're not ready to understand that yet, but one day you'll be ready to understand that. So I always had that, um, in, I think, in the back of my mind. But then as I, as I grew older, I wasn't really even interested in school. All I wanted to do was run. And so uh, when I went to college, finally, uh, I majored in math just because it was easiest. And I didn't have to write term papers and, and then didn't have lab reports. I didn't have to believe in other people's opinions because would, that, would, that was always really hard to swallow. And so it was something that, you know, I could figure it out for myself. I'd do my homework, I'd be done, that'd be it, and I can go run. And uh, so, but then it became, uh, as soon as I started taking serious math courses, it became really interesting and I just devoured it and I couldn't get enough. Um, I was fortunate that I went to a very small school, Humboldt State University. I took all the classes, and it was a, I mean, it's, it was a great curriculum, and it taught, got me where I needed to go. And, and, the, and the upside of that was that uh, I didn't have a lot of pressure on me, and I could study at the rate that I, I could learn whatever I wanted to learn without, uh, uh, without any pressure. And so um, I guess the reason I've, gravitated to math, I think always deep down, even when I wasn't so interested in school, I always felt that math was kind of the right and proper thing to do, just because I saw that when I was growing up. And so, uh, so what I, I guess I would say is that uh, what I tell students, a lot of times in my office I have this conversation, what am I going to do with my life? I'm not really sure if I want to go to graduate school. Like, I mean, this is something that we talk about all the time with our students. And what I say is, a lot of times you're not really sure something, you know, a lifetime commitment like that is not something that you can just wake up one day and say, I want to be a mathematician. You know, it's not, it's, it's, it's something that has to happen to you gradually. And I wasn't really smart enough to know that that was going to be my destiny for many years, even well into graduate school. I wasn't really sure that that was really how I wanted to spend my life. And, but then it just, it's the sort of thing where you just, kind of accept, it's not a decision that you reach for, it's a decision that you accept when it comes to you. And I think it's similar to being a musician. So I also dabbled in music. And um, one of the things that musicians always tell their students is don't be a musician unless you can't do anything else. It has to come to you that that's your only path. And, and I would say that also about being a mathematician, being a math teacher, like if you're going to teach high school or something like that, that's one thing. But the part that I know about, which is actually being a mathematician, is something that you should only do if that's all you can do. And it took me a long time to realize that that was the only thing that, was cut out, that I was cut out for. And I'm really lucky that I found it.